And now, Chapter 30, Lord Balaram visits Vrindavan. Lord Balaram became very anxious to see his father and mother, Maharaj Nanda and Yashoda. Therefore, with great enthusiasm, he started on a chariot for Vrindavan. The inhabitants of Vrindavan had been anxious to see Krishna and Balaram for a very long time. When Lord Balaram returned to Vrindavan, all the cowherd boys and the gopis had grown up. But still, on his arrival, they all embraced him and Balaram embraced them in reciprocation. After this, he came before Maharaj Nanda and Yashoda and offered his respectful obeisances. In response, Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj offered their blessings unto him. They addressed him as Jagadeshvara, or the Lord of the Universe, who maintains everyone. The reason for this was that both Krishna and Balaram maintain all living entities, and yet Nanda and Yashoda were put into such difficulties on account of their absence. Feeling like this, they embraced Balaram, and seating him on their laps, began their perpetual crying, wetting Balaram with their tears. Lord Balaram then offered his respectful obeisances to the elderly cowherd men, and accepted the obeisances of the younger cowherd men. Thus, according to their different ages and relationships, Lord Balaram exchanged feelings of friendship with them. He shook hands with those who were his equals in age and friendship, and with loud laughing embraced each one of them. After being received by the cowherd men and boys, the gopis and King Nanda and Yashoda, Lord Balaram sat down feeling satisfied, and they all surrounded him. First, Lord Balaram inquired from them about their welfare, and then, not having seen him for such a long time, they began to ask him different questions. The inhabitants of Vrindavan had sacrificed everything for Krishna, simply being captivated by the lotus eyes of the Lord. Because of their great desire to love Krishna, they never desired anything like elevation to the heavenly planets or merging into the effulgence of Brahman to become one with the absolute truth. They were not even interested, interested in enjoying a life of opulence, but were satisfied in living a simple life in the village as cowherd men. They were always absorbed in thoughts of Krishna and did not desire any personal benefits. And they were all so much in love with him that in his absence, their voices faltered when they began to inquire from Balaramji. First Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda Mai inquired, My dear Balaram, are our friends like Vasudev and others in the family doing well? Now you and Krishna are grown up married men with children. In the happiness of family life, do you sometimes remember your poor father and mother, Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda Devi? It is very good news that the most sinful King Kamsa has been killed by you, and that our friends like Vasudev and the others who had been harassed have now been relieved. It is also very good news that both you and Krishna defeated Jarasandha and Kalayavan, who is now dead, and that you are now living in a fortified residence in Dvorka. When the gopis arrived, Lord Balaram glanced over them with loving eyes. Being overjoyed, the gopis, who had so long been mortified on account of Krishna's and Balaram's absence, began to ask about the welfare of the two brothers. They specifically asked Balaram whether Krishna was enjoying his life surrounded by the enlightened women of Dvorkapuri. Does he sometimes remember his father Nanda and his mother Yashoda and the other friends with whom he so intimately behaved while in Vrindavan? Does Krishna have any plans to come here to see his mother, Yashoda? 
And does he remember us gopis who are now pitiably bereft of his company? Krishna may have forgotten us in the midst of the cultured women of Dvorka, but as far as we are concerned, we still remember him by collecting flowers and sewing them into garlands. When he does not come, however, we simply pass our time by crying. If only he would come here and accept these garlands we have made. Dear Lord Balaram, descendant of Dasharha, you know that we would give up everything for Krishna's friendship. Even in great distress, one cannot give up the connection of family members. But although it might be impossible for others, we gave up our fathers, mothers, sisters, and relatives without caring at all about our renunciation. Then all of a sudden, Krishna renounced us and went away. He broke off our intimate relationship without serious consideration and left for a foreign country. But he was so clever and cunning that he manufactured very nice words, he said. My dear gopis, please do not worry. The service you have rendered me is impossible for me to repay. After all, we are women, so how could we disbelieve him? Now we can understand that his sweet words were simply for cheating us. Protesting Krishna's absence from Vrindavan, another gopi said, My dear Balaramji, we are of course village girls, so Krishna could cheat us in that way. But what about the women of Dvorka? Don't think they are as foolish as we are. We village women might be misled by Krishna, but the women in the city of Dvorka are very clever and intelligent. Therefore, I would be surprised if such city women could be misled by Krishna and could believe his words. Then another gopi began to speak. My dear friend, she said, Krishna is very clever in using words. No one can compete with him in that art. He can manufacture such colorful words and talk so sweetly that the heart of any woman would be misled. Besides that, he has perfected the art of smiling very attractively, and by seeing his smile, women become mad after him and would give themselves to him without hesitation. Another gopi, after hearing this, said, My dear friends, what is the use of talking about Krishna? If you are at all interested in passing time by talking, let us talk on some subject other than him. If cruel Krishna can pass his time without us, why can't we pass our time without Krishna? Of course, Krishna is passing his days without us very happily, but we cannot pass our days happily without him. When the gopis were talking in this way, their feelings for Krishna became more and more intense, and they were experiencing Krishna's smiling, Krishna's words of love, Krishna's attractive features, Krishna's characteristics, and Krishna's embraces. By the force of their ecstatic feelings, it appeared to them that Krishna was personally present and dancing before them. Because of their sweet remembrance of Krishna, they could not check their tears, and they began to cry without consideration. Lord Balaram, of course, could understand the ecstatic feelings of the gopis, and therefore he wanted to pacify them. He was expert in presenting an appeal, and thus treating the gopis very respectfully he began to narrate the stories of Krishna so tactfully that the gopis became satisfied. To keep the gopis in Vrindavan satisfied, Lord Balaram stayed there continuously for two months 
namely the months of Chaitra, March to April, and Vaishaka, April to May. For those two months he kept himself among the gopis, and he passed every night with them in the forest of Vrindavan to satisfy their desire for conjugal love. Thus Balaram also enjoyed the Ras dance with the gopis during those two months. Since the season was springtime, the breeze on the bank of the Yamuna was blowing very mildly, carrying the aroma of different flowers, especially the flower known as Komudi. Moonlight filled the sky and spread everywhere, and thus the banks of the Yamuna appeared very bright and pleasing, and Lord Balaram enjoyed the company of the gopis there. The demigod known as Varun sent his daughter, Varuni, in the form of liquid honey oozing from the hollows of the trees. Because of this honey, the whole forest became aromatic, and the sweet aroma of the liquid honey, Varuni, captivated Balaramji. Balaramji and all the gopis became very much attracted by the taste of Varuni, and all of them drank it together. While drinking this natural beverage, all the gopis chanted the glories of Lord Balaram, and Lord Balaram felt very happy, as if he had become intoxicated by drinking that Varuni beverage. His eyes rolled in a pleasing attitude. He was decorated with long garlands of forest flowers, and the whole situation appeared to be a great function of happiness because of this transcendental bliss. Lord Balaram smiled beautifully, and the drops of perspiration decorating his face appeared like soothing morning dew. While Balaram was in that happy mood, he desired to enjoy the company of the gopis in the water of the Yamuna. Therefore he called Yamuna to come nearby. But Yamuna neglected the order of Balaramji considering him intoxicated. Lord Balaram became very much displeased at Yamuna's neglecting his order. He immediately wanted to scratch the land near the river with his plowshare. Lord Balaram has two weapons, a plow and a club, from which he takes service when they are required. This time he wanted to bring the Yamuna by force, and he took the help of his plow. He wanted to punish Yamuna because she did not come in obedience to his order. He addressed Yamuna, You wretched river, you did not care for my order. Now I shall teach you a lesson. You did not come to me voluntarily. Now with the help of my plow, I shall force you to come. I shall divide you into hundreds of scattered streams. When Yamuna was threatened like this, she became greatly afraid of the power of Balaram, and immediately came in person, falling at his lotus feet and praying thus, My dear Balaram, you are the most powerful personality, and you are pleasing to everyone. Unfortunately, I forgot your glorious, exalted position, but now I have come to my senses, and I remember that you hold all the planetary systems on your head merely by your partial expansion as Shesha. You are the sustainer of the whole universe, my dear Supreme Personality of Godhead. You are full of six opulences. Because I forgot your omnipotence, I have mistakenly disobeyed your order, and thus I have become a great offender. But my dear Lord, please know that I am a soul surrendered unto you, who are very much affectionate to your devotees. Therefore, please excuse my impudence and mistakes, and by your causeless mercy, may you now release me. Upon displaying the submissive attitude, Yamuna was forgiven, and when she came nearby, Lord Balaram wanted to enjoy the pleasure of swimming in her water along with the gopis in the same way that an elephant enjoys himself 
along with his many she-elephants. After a long time, when Lord Balaram had enjoyed to his full satisfaction, he came out of the water and immediately a goddess of fortune offered him a nice blue garment and a valuable necklace made of gold. After taking bath in the Yamuna, Lord Balaram dressed in blue garments and decorated with golden ornaments looked very attractive to everyone. Lord Balaram's complexion is white and when he was properly dressed he looked exactly like the white elephant of King Indra in the heavenly planet. The river Yamuna still has many small branches due to being scratched by the plowshare of Lord Balaram and all these branches of the river Yamuna still glorify the omnipotence of Lord Balaram. Lord Balaram and the gopis enjoy transcendental pastimes together every night for two months and time passed away so quickly that all those nights appear to be only one night. In the presence of Lord Balaram, all the gopis and inhabitants of Vrindavan became as cheerful as they had been before in the presence of both brothers, Lord Krishna and Balaram. Thus ends the Bhakti Vedanta purport of the second volume, thirtieth chapter of Krishna, Lord Balaram visits Vrindavan.